Hon bil weekend hon en kempeu na ve kon chibai tu nei holim piding hei le hiai i kam songa de para mi pia mi tu pile ho vel level tana world leader hi thei pu john el pudai te ama hi le bible for the world president na hi a ama hi le i kam songa mi tu pi ma ma ro chunga pudai te apa hi a hi a background le pa le ma ma i kam songa ding a christian organization dynamic le na tam pi sem pi ms society le president na hi a tu nin Lam kau pelam tangan hi, jangan hi holding pidi hi. Puson, first of all, thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you, Mang. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Yeah. So, what's your impression coming down to Churchanpur once in a while? Your beautiful home is here. Well, it's been a long time because usually I used to come here every year at least two or three times. But because of the pandemic, we have been stuck outside for. More than two years, mm -hmm. so I'm coming back after quite a while, since early 2020. Yeah. You being a son of Puro Chunga Pudaite, we are having interview in English, and it, it seems that you you are not much comfortable communicating in Mara language or local dialect. How challenging it is for you to speak and communicate in Mara language? It's a bit challenging to express myself very clearly. Mm. Um, you know, I, I only mm. learned Mara much after I was grown up. I Though my parents would speak it to me in the house, mm. we would never speak it since we grew up in the States. So mm. we're with our friends, our teachers, everybody's speaking English. So this is really, you know, first language. Mara is a second language, even a third language. I learned French before I learned Mara, actually. <laughs> So do you have any uh, do you have any guilty feeling or uncomfortable not knowing much about your local dialect or it's because of circumstances? <laughs> it's certainly because of circumstances. Um, mm. I don't I don't feel mm. bad regrets myself. I don't fault my parents at all for this. Mm. But uh, at the same time, mm. when um, when I got married and had my son. And my uh, first daughter, Joshua and Hannah, mm -hmm. I wanted to stay here mm -hmm. so that from their, you know, from the time they're very young, they would mm -hmm. speak Mar as their first language. Mm -hmm. And so we're blessed to be able to be living here most of the time mm -hmm. until Joshua was about four years old, until um, Hannah was two, two and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And so they speak more fluently than I do because they learned at such a young age. It's really amazing. Um, mm. But my son, Joshua, he still corrects me on my mar. <laughs> That's true. Even though we're staying over in the States mostly for mm. the last uh, five, six years now. I see. So you might be leaving the, uh, one of the best country, the best country, America, but still how much concern do you have for the people here and how much of your heart is here? Oh my. <laughs> Yeah, you know, even though I grew up there, was born there and grew up there, mm -hmm. since an early age, my parents had really instilled in us um, this love for India, especially this love for Northeast India mm -hmm. and the people of this region. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all through the time as I was growing up, we would come and visit maybe only once every four years. Mm -hmm. But when I got a chance after college, I came here and was able to stay here more or less for seven years straight working on the poultry farm and other related projects. Mm -hmm. And so that just deepened my love for this area mm -hmm. and uh, just to work with the people and uh, to try to help give opportunities to them. 
Your father has been a legendary Christian leader, excellent in his record and impeccable in his, uh, with his work. How big it is for you to fill up his shoes and go in the line of ministry? <laughs> oh my, oh my. That's, it's amazing. Of course, I learned a lot from my times that I've stayed here as I traveled mm. to so many different villages mm. in the hills mm. and to see the impact of my father's work mm. and those of the early pioneers of the mission work. And beyond that, uh, my father, who uh, under his mm. founding and leading Bibles for the World, mm. has now distributed God's Word in over 120 countries of the world. Mm. And so that legacy to follow is mm. at times very heavy <laughs> because uh, mm. for us, we're born in more modern times. But you mm. think about people from my father's generation. Mm. They're born in a time there's no electricity, mm. there's no cars in the hills, there's no road, no blacktop road, no running mm. water, none of these things, mm. you know. And mm. uh, we grew up, you know, from a fairly early age, having access to computers, mm. having, you know, amazing communication. completely different, mm. uh, you know, the technical, technological advancements, even by the time we were becoming adults, and they are coming from a time that's really much closer to the Stone Age than to the, to the modern age. So we really respect the work of those who have gone before us. Even now, as I meet with the leadership team here, those who are heading up our, our mission in the various departments, I always remind them that, you know, we are here by God's grace and also because we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm. Those were giants of the faith who mm. God gave a vision mm. in those early days mm. for what God could do here through the mission, through the church. Mm. And so this is what we, the footsteps that we're following on. Mm. And it's interesting, all of our forefathers are also very short, early founders of the mission. My father mm. was only five feet, two inches tall. Uh, some of his uh, leadership team here were five feet, five feet, four inches. So when I say we're standing on the shoulders of giants, mm. you know, it really has a visual impact that, you know, mm. even though they were short in stature, they were giants of the faith. Mm. So uh, size is just only numbers huh, for yeah. them. Size is... <laughs> Size does not matter. Yeah. Size physically does not matter. Mm. It is the size of the faith mm. and the vision that God has mm. given. That's what matters. You could have many options in life to follow different profession. What makes you to choose this line of profession, ministry, working for the Bible? Mm. How do you make that decision? Is that imposed by your father or inspired by your father? <laughs> well, you know, my parents were very... They never forced me into it. Mm. Of course, they always prayed and hoped that I would somehow follow mm. in their footsteps, carry on the ministry or some aspect of the ministry. Mm. But they really gave us, meaning my brother, my sister and I, freedom to pursue mm. what we were interested in. Mm. And of course, in the US, we have access to a lot of different facilities, training, um, things like that. So I certainly explored quite a few different things. I actually uh, explored being a pilot. I was only 16 years old. I was mm. flying solo even at that time mm. when I was only 16. Mm. I didn't even have a driver's license, but I was <laughs> flying a plane solo, mm. actually. And uh, so things like that. I, I um, got involved in film and video production for many years mm. and uh, produced some award-winning documentaries that were seen mm. around the world in different film festivals. Can you, can you specifically mention that award-winning documentaries because uh, we are leaving YouTube age, everyone can Google it. <laughs> we can see. There is one, I don't even know if it's mm. on YouTube, mm. but uh, I made it back and we shot it back in 1985-86 
and it is called Freak Street to Goa, mm. Immigrants on the Rajpath. Mm. And we shot it um, in Nepal and in India. Mm. And Freak Street was a place in Kathmandu mm. where all the hippies mm. from the West, whether from America, from Europe, they came mm. over to India and Nepal. Mm. And so we connected with some of the remnants of those who had come over in the 1960s and 70s mm. and had decided to make India and Nepal their permanent home. Mm. And it's a very interesting exploration of these ex-hippies, you could say, who started to assimilate into the local culture, bringing some of the ideas mm. that they brought with them, and then helping build up the people uh, in Nepal mm. and in, in India. Mm. So the title of the film is based on Freak Street, the area where they all used to hang around and congregate in Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. And then Goa, which at that time was very unknown, undeveloped. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. they would travel back and forth. Mm -hmm. They would spend the summers in Nepal, mm -hmm. stay there about six months, and they would migrate down to the beaches in Goa mm -hmm. and live there for about six months and back and forth. They would travel. And so this was an interesting film, especially as we were looking at... Mm -hmm the 20th anniversary mm. of the 60s, the hippie movement, Woodstock, mm. things like that, mm. that um, where are they 20 years later? Mm. Where are they now? Mm. And so this film was, um, I um, co-directed it. He used to be my uh, professor mm. um, it, of film. Mm. And we, he, we co-directed it. He had actually spent quite a bit of time in Nepal himself. Mm. And we had another member our, of our team who had grown up in Nepal. Mm. It's a very interesting. Blonde hair, blue eyes, spoke fluent Nepali. Mm. You know? And so they would see me, they would think in Nepal, they would start to speak to me in Nepali. I didn't speak a word of Nepali at that time. Mm. And, they would, and then my friend who had grown up in Nepal, mm. American, he would speak back to them in Nepali, fluent Nepali. So we had an interesting team that came together. Mm. And this was uh, shown in film festivals in Amsterdam, mm. uh, all over the U.S. I'm trying to remember, it's so long ago now. Mm. But uh, it's called Freak Street to Goa. It may be available on YouTube or somewhere. Mm. That's, that's, that's quite interesting life. You have yeah. been flying at age of 16, making film, winning the comment, the, what winning the commentaries. Then beside that, what else did you do before coming to ministry? Oh my. <laughs> oh my. Um, you know, primarily over here, my interest has been in economic development. Hmm. I've been involved with the, uh, we had a North Star poultry farm here. Hmm. And uh, the, the, we weren't doing that simply to do business or to make money, but it was also to help mm. the people here of the area. Mm. And so at that time, this was uh, late 80s, early 90s, mm. when we did this project, mm. uh, we had a good sized staff, so we were mm. providing employment, but we were also working with the farmers in the area to grow corn and other crops for us mm. that we would use for the feed. Mm. because we had our own feed manufacturing plant here. And so in that way, the impact of the farm was not just even to the workers, it was also to all of these farmers mm. that we could provide them a very good price for their, um, for their corn and other products, anything we could use, mm. rather than them selling it to a middleman mm. who would take his profit mm. We were the end user, so we could pay a better price. Mm. You know, maybe it's only 50 paisa or one rupee more, mm. but for a small farmer, it's very significant. Mm. So in this way, we use the project to try to help in the economic growth and development of the area. So we had growers all over this Church Ampur district, mm. and we would send our truck around to collect, mm. collect the, the mm. uh, corn, maize, as we mm. call it, vimeem. Mm. What do you call Kolbu? Kolbu yeah. <laughs> yeah, at the juncture, let me ask you, Zon, 
what do how do you read that economic uh, that economic venture was it really challenging or how do you read your success of that venture it is really challenging because mm. we are in such a remote area mm. and we were depending on supplies of certain ingredients let's mm. say uh, for the mm. poultry feed from outside our fish meal was from gujarat mm. our soybean meal was from indoor in madhya pradesh so if there was some you know blockage in the supply chain whether problems in siliguri or problems in nagaland or problems here in manipur uh, bonds blockades what not it really could hamper our activities and especially poultry where you're raising a live a living animal they cannot go without food for even a few days Mm. And so those were made it very mm. challenging. Mm. Um, but overall, because our purpose was not only to try to run a profitable enterprise, but it was also to help um, the, le- the more disadvantaged in the community, mm. uh, we kept pushing ahead. Mm. It was, uh, it's interesting, we, mm. you know, at one time we had about 18,000 chickens up there. Mm. And about 6,000 of them were mature and laying eggs. So every day we had mm. 4,500 eggs, something like that. Mm. It was wonderful in those days to go in the morning, 5 o'clock, and collect that many eggs. Mm. But what was more amazing was the women who came mm. to collect those eggs from us mm. were coming from villages 5, 8, 10 kilometers away. Mm. And they would walk up mm. to our farm and carry one box or two box of eggs, take it back to their village, Mm. and then sell it there, Mm. and then again come back the next day, like that. Mm. And um, we found out that, and most of them were uh, widows or single mothers that Mm. were coming, Mm. and they were supporting their family Mm. from the small profit they could make on those eggs every day. And that was very, very heartwarming to me. Mm to know that that's the people that we wanted to have the receive the benefit that's the people we wanted to bless by that project were those who didn't have any other opportunities they they're not qualified for a government job they don't have the capital or means to even run a small uh, grocery shop but yet they could earn a living and support their children send them to school because of the their connection and their work with selling the eggs for our farm. And uh, so those were things that were really made it, mm-hmm. you know, gratifying to me to mm-hmm. see it successful in that way. When was that uh, venture carried out, can you recall the year? Yeah, we started that back in 1988-89. And it mm-hmm. really took off in the early 90s. So that no. was the area that we had a lot of growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the project. Now almost a decade has gone, so how much interested are you still in the economy of the, the people living here? Unemployment is a re- reality that is a stark reality, a grim reality that is facing every young people and every everybody in the society. Mm-hmm. To get down to the reality of the scenarios, so many educated unemployed young people yeah. who are educated enough but to be ashamed of manual labor. Mm. Some smart ones would go to insurgency, try to play politics or put up arms in the name of some tribe or something. So you can see so many dawns coming up. Mm. <laughs> so many insurgency leaders here. Not only that, the only available government jobs are brought by some rich people. Mm-hmm. And the worst of the worst is we are left with nothing to be done. Jum cultivation is not reaping enough for survivability, mm-hmm. but that's the last option people are doing, even though they know it's not. So how much are you interested in the economy of the people of Lamka? What is your idea? Do you think of something which can be, that has to be changed? If we're looking at the scenario there in Mizoram, at least they don't have outsiders doing business so many shops and markets, they're so good in efficient business to compare with the people of Lamka. Hmm. But here, unfortunately, 70% of the business is captured by people who are coming outside 
and they are draining out the wealth of Lamka. But we're still not awakening. Mm-hmm. Even if we are awakening, even if we have enterprising young people, the banks are not giving enough loans. It looks like the rich are going to get richer and there is hardly any chance for promising young people or someone who even want to take up. Mm-hmm. So how do you read the situation and what, what do you think should be done? <laughs> Boy, that's a big question because <laughs> it's not only economics, it's uh, this whole society and it's mm-hmm. politics and so mm-hmm. many things mixed together. Mm-hmm. But uh, of course it's good that our people are now getting educated. Mm-hmm. Um, it has been certainly uh, the work of the mission and others like-minded, mm-hmm. like my father, who saw the mm-hmm. early need for education, even mm-hmm. establishing our Silmak Christian Higher Secondary School back in 1959, mm-hmm. seeing that as the need of the people. That is the, the best form of development mm-hmm. um, because by giving education, someone mm-hmm. learns to think for themselves, someone learns to make their own way in life, whereas any other type of development or especially things that are handouts, as it were. Mm. Somebody will be hungry again tomorrow. Somebody Mm. will need again in a week, two weeks. Mm. That need will always be there. Mm. But um, if we teach people through education, they can learn to make a way for themselves. Mm. But then you have the problem, as you mentioned, the educated yet unemployed. Mm. And there's a problem here, I think, is that, um, as you mentioned, they don't want to do manual labor. You know, um, this is something that in the West, whether it be in Europe or USA, Canada, you know, people are not ashamed to do manual labor. You know, uh, if that is the work and the station in life and the opportunity God has given you, Mm. you have to accept it, Mm. even if it's just for a time, and do it wholeheartedly. Mm. And so, uh, you know, It's not something ever to be ashamed of Mm. or to feel embarrassed about. Mm. And that was one of the things with the farm here that I did. I mean, I was out there Mm. with Bong Titlo and Mm. everything, you know, Mm. doing all the work, carrying the feed on my back, things like that. Because I wanted to demonstrate that, you know, Mm. um, an honest living earned salary, daily wage, that has dignity, mm-hmm. right? To get money by any other, you know, lesser means, whether it be by stealing or some free handout, something like that, that has, doesn't give a person dignity, mm-hmm. self-worth. But mm-hmm. if we earn it by the sweat of our own brow, by our mm-hmm. own hard work, mm-hmm. that is always much mm-hmm. more satisfying, mm-hmm. whether it be a huge amount, small mm-hmm. amount. And this is something we need to learn we need to relearn. Our forefathers knew it mm. in the villages. Mm. They worked hard in the fields, cultivating ginger, cultivating rice, cultivating these things. Mm. But they had a lot of honor. They had a lot of nobility because of that. It was mm. from their own hard work mm. that, um, that their families could come up, that mm. perhaps they could afford to send a son, a, a daughter to school. And so we need to restore that. It's not about getting rich and having quick money. Mm. This has been the problem. Mm. Development has to come steadily. The entire society has to move up Mm. together. Otherwise, the weakest links in the chain will always break the the chain. Mm. Likewise, the weaker sections of the society will bring down the society. And Mm. so like that, we have to keep pushing Mm. for all of us to develop, not just for the rich to get richer, Mm. but all of us to come up together. Having been uh, working as the top leader around the world as Christian leader, what is your evaluation about the society, the present scenario in Churchanpur? We have been Christian for 100 years, Mm -hmm. and we are almost 100% Christian. This is a city of churches. Mm -hmm. Every stone through these tents, there is church. According to the description of Pu El Kevom in Jorab Kovel, he even said that Mm-hmm. The people who can play the loudest mic seem thought that they are the most spiritual. <laughs> but my question is, are we really living out our Christianity? The paradox is, 
We are hundred percent Christians, but there is no clean election. We have insurgency problem. We are the world leader in HIV, looking at population ratio, mm -hmm. and we are the most corrupted people. Mm. Where should we restart again? If this keep on going, will there be a time when people will be leaving churches and don't trust in the churches? What is your evaluation? How, how big is the threat? Well, I think it is something, you know, mm. as you bring it up, that we certainly have to be mindful of. We have to be watching. Mm. And um, we need people who are bold enough to speak out against some of these uh, mm. corruptions against things, social evils, things as our society is, you know, veering away mm. from the real truth that's found in God's word. Mm. People need to be bold enough to speak up, to stand, stand up and speak out against these things. Certainly is necessary. I don't know, uh, you know, having been spending the last five, six years primarily in the States and not mm. having come out for two, three years now, Mm. Uh, due to the pandemic, mm. it's a little difficult to say too much specific mm. because I'm a little bit out of touch right now with the local situation. I'm just mm. here a few days now and getting caught up even on our own details of our ministry and mission mm. activities. Mm. But uh, in some way you say, well, we're the most corrupt. I don't think so, actually. We are, there is certainly corruption mm. here. Mm. But there are countries in the world where it's even worse, frankly. Mm. I've traveled to a few of those. Mm. And it's such a shame. I mean, there's places like Haiti where, you know, governments like the U.S. and mm. other countries have been pouring money into that small mm. island nation of Haiti, mm. as well as Christians and ministries and churches, mm. giving so much assistance for the people of that country, but mm. so much has been corrupted away. It's mm. it's like, it's literally in terms of billions of dollars a year goes into Haiti. But mm. if you go there, you would not see anything mm. result of it. All the money is corrupted away. Mm. So um, I'd say yes, corruption is a problem here. It's a problem in many parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, but there are places worse than us. And it's something that, um, mm. It's just a shame that uh, it has to go on like this. We need people to stand up against it, people to speak out against it. We need people to be strong against it. And this is just the problem again, you know, I mentioned of mm. kind of running after the quick money. Mm. You know, those are things that don't last. You know, we need things, firm, steadily built foundation mm. will last a lot longer. Not just within my lifetime, but thinking mm. for the generation to the next generation, next generation. As I look back again on my father and the work of the forefathers, because it had a strong, mm. solid foundation, mm. it's relatively easy to take on, to mm. carry on the work. Well, John, being one of our prominent leader, even in global stage, working as president of the Bible for the world. So how threatening is our Christianity here in Northeast with the present scenario that is going on in India with a very strong BJP trend going on with Hindu mm -hmm. and suffranization, including Manipur. And the hardest are the Christians with our FCRA. Yes, yes. So survivality of Christianity is at stake or we have to be able to stand without any sponsorship or uh, fundings coming from abroad. How how do you read the future of Christianity here? Hmm. Well, that's a big question because it touches on a lot of things, but um, I'll say yes. We certainly know it for our mission and mm. a lot of my uh, mm. associates in the U.S. are involved in some way in mission work around the world. A lot of them involved in India. Mm. And certainly as the BJP has come into power in the center, I believe it's from 2014, mm. we have seen this, you know, steadily increasing persecution, mm. oppression, mm. restrictions being placed on Christians and Christian organizations, mm. whether they be churches or Christian NGOs, ministries, mm. the increased scrutiny on different levels, mm. in, in addition to the physical, mm. mental oppression and persecution you know, where we see outbreaks like in mm. Orissa or in different parts of uh, the south, maybe in uh, Karnataka, 
Um, and as we see individual states passing anti-conversion laws, this is a big concern um, that the whole country will go to a nationwide anti-conversion bill. So there are things happening at a lot of different levels, at the ground level, in the political levels, in the economic levels, or financial levels. The FCRA, you mentioned, Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, this has posed a lot of problems certainly for Christian organizations, not just here in Manipur or Northeast, but across India. Mm -hmm. Literally tens of thousands of organizations have had their FCRA uh, registration canceled. Mm -hmm. Many thousands have, ha have applications pending that mm -hmm. have not been approved. Mm -hmm. And so each of these organizations is under uh, much heightened scrutiny mm -hmm. Um, even ourselves, we're, we have been under a lot of scrutiny here, but it goes way back, even before the BJP. By God's grace, we've been one of the larger NGOs in, in Northeast India. Mm. And so we have been subjected to a complete audit of all our mm. uh, accounts, mm. foreign funds, local funds, every year. Mm. Um, since going back in 2005, six, you know, almost 20 years now. But it's, it's okay because we know that um, our organization is built on accountability and integrity. Mm. From the beginning, this has been a mm. strong pillar of my father's work as we're going to do this. We're doing this work for the Lord. Mm. This is the Lord's money. This mm. is not our own money. We have to carry out with that mm. accountability. And so building on that foundation and continuing the process of handling the money, of uh, disbursing the need, the aid, the different projects and programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we continue that to this day mm -hmm. with complete transparency mm -hmm. and we can go for scrutiny from mm -hmm. the various government departments, whether it's income tax, ministry, home affairs, you name it. And uh, we, we are, by God's grace, continuing to be able to send funds from America uh, and, and continue the work here. We have been talking a lot of interesting things about life and you know, about <laughs> patient. But one thing that we shouldn't miss to talk about is uh, what is the world, uh, Bible for the World doing exactly? What's the impact around the world? And can you tell us something about mm -hmm. what is the, your work and what's, sure. what's the mission and vision? Well, the work of Bibles for the World grew out of my father's work, which here is continuously be known as Partnership Mission Society. And it also grew out of his work in translating the Bible mm -hmm. into the Mar language. Mm -hmm. And after he completed that work, he asked the Lord, Lord, what's next? What should I do? What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. This big project I spent mm -hmm. more than 20 years working on is now completed. Mm -hmm. And that's when God gave him the vision to, to share the gospel message with people, mm -hmm. first across India mm -hmm. and neighboring countries. And it just kept growing and growing. Mm. And by God's grace, we've been able to provide Bibles, New Testaments, Gospels of John mm. in over 120 countries around the world. Mm. And uh, taking this on from my father, I mean, he had blazed the trail. He had mm. made the way. But I have been really working hard to find out ways that we can get the Word of God into countries where it's mm. restricted, where it's mm. difficult, mm. where the people have never had a chance to have a Bible. We frankly, we're so blessed here, and mm. even though we're in India and mm. problems with uh, Hindutva forces, uh, with BJP mm. and RSS and whatnot, but there are countries, you know, places like Cuba or places like Laos, Vietnam, mm. uh, North Korea, China, where Bibles are not available at all, mm. and uh, government restrictions are there. Mm. And so these are the things that get me very excited mm. when somebody says, you can't get a Bible into that country. It's like, okay, we're going to find out how we'll do that. There's got to mm. be a way. If God wants His Word to reach there, He'll mm. make a way for it. He'll, mm. he'll open a door for us. Mm. And so, you know, in that way, He's opened up some very interesting opportunities for us even in these last few years, even mm -hmm. under COVID, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. time. He keeps presenting to us doors, open doors, you, you know, as we meet people, as we network, as we interact, as we meet potential partners, mm-hmm. and giving us some really mm-hmm. interesting, exciting opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, one of these is China. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as a family, well, let me say this. My father, having translated the Bible, mm-hmm. and now involved in worldwide Bible distribution, he always would say, this book, God's Word is the book of the King of Kings. I'm going to take it in through the front door. I'm not going to take it in through the back door. Hmm. So what he meant was, I'm going to search for a legal way Hmm. to distribute God's Word in the countries where we want to go. I'm not going to be involved in smuggling, Hmm. Bible smuggling. There are certainly organizations who are involved in that, Hmm. and that is how God has called them. Mm. That is very well and good, mm. if that's God's calling, but that was my father's um, you know, principle, mm. that we will not smuggle. Mm. You know, we're also commanded to obey the laws of the land, obey the, you know, pay respect to the emperor, and so we have to honor the respective governments that God has put, allowed to be in power. So we prayed as a family, we prayed as an organization for maybe 30 years for God to open a door in China. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it was really bittersweet for me because that mm-hmm. door opened only months, literally months after my father passed away, after mm-hmm. my father went to heaven. Went to heaven in October 10th, 2015. And it was in April, just about six, seven months later, that I met a person, mm-hmm. a man who said, I can... I have a legal way for you to distribute Bibles in China. And so we went, we started discussion and explored that. And so now every year since 2017, we've been distributing, we started with 300,000 Gospels of John, 10, 12, 15,000 Bibles and New Testaments. That has continued. We raised it up to 500,000 Gospels of John uh, in 2019, Mm. especially with the... the Xi Jinping government mm. starting to crack down on, on mm. Christians, mm. starting to tighten things, especially for the uh, mm. house churches, the unregistered churches, or we may have heard them as underground churches. Mm. And so we've been continuing to increase that. Last year we provided 600,000 Gospels of John and mm. about 15,000 Bibles. So we, we provide the Bibles to the believers Many of them have never had a Bible for themselves. They're a follower of Christ. We, had, we met one lady. She had been a Christian for over 50 years. Mm. She was 83 years old. She had never had her own Bible. Mm. Oh, the joy on her face when I handed that Bible to her, that she actually would have it for herself. But then we also challenged them um, that, okay, we're going to give you a Bible for yourself, but we want you to also pass on the blessing that you have received personally. We want you to pass on this Gospel of John Mm -hmm. to people in your community, in your neighborhood, Mm -hmm. in your town, wherever you are, that you have these. Mm -hmm. So we usually give one Bible and 30 to 50 Gospels of John so they can carry the message Mm -hmm. to others. For us, it's not legal. We can only give out that Bible inside the church, the registered Mm -hmm. church. Mm. And we can only give them the New Testament or Gospels of John there. Mm. But they are free to take it outside. So we have to be, work very carefully, mm. sort of jumping through the loopholes uh, of the law in China. Mm. But God has given this, uh, this way to provide mm. now over 2 million Gospels of John in China in the last five years. How big is that it working now? How many workforce do you have under, under this organization? Wow. Actually, we are a small organization. We are less than 15 people mm-hmm. on staff in the U.S. We um, have a few of them are raising mm-hmm. either full support or partial support. Mm-hmm. But um, we work not by going to a country and setting up an office and hiring staff and, mm. and all of that. Mm. But we find like-minded mm. partners who are already working in that country. Usually it's the people of that country 
Mm-hmm. So, and then as we start to work with them, we'll keep expanding that network. Mm-hmm. For example, in Nepal now, mm-hmm. we have provided now, we have printed three million copies of the Gospel of John for that small country of Nepal. Mm-hmm. We've distributed uh, probably about 2.7 million of those, so 27 lakhs copies now. Mm-hmm. And um, it, along the way, we have been working with over 2,000 Nepali Christian pastors, missionaries, and evangelists. So they become, mm. we partner with them, we provide them with God's Word to equip them mm. to do the work as they are traveling, witnessing, visiting the remote villages. They can provide that Gospel of John. Mm. Uh, and so we are giving them the tools to work with, sometimes mm. we say, or we're giving them the ammunition. Mm. the bullets for their gun Mm. to go out with the gospel. And so this is the role that Bibles for the World plays, is to equip the people in whatever country, whether it be in China or India or Nepal, Bhutan. Mm. Um, Recently we've been working in Cambodia Mm. and Vietnam Mm. and uh, also quite a number of countries in Africa, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, um, Malawi, South Africa, uh, Uganda, Kenya, these are all countries that we're working in right now through different partners. Mm. So this has been mm. our strategy, mm. especially in the last 15, 20 years, mm. that we try to find like-minded, strong mm. uh, partners to carry it, to work together with us in ministry, mm. partners of integrity, those that we know. If we provide them 50,000 scriptures, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll distribute those very sincerely, they'll mm-hmm. do carry out the work. And so like that, God has been giving us a lot of wonderful contacts around the world. So, Prasod, can you tell me how, far, how, how, how big is uh, PMS, Partnership Mission Society, growing and what are the impact that's having around? Mm-hmm. Well, Partnership Mission Society is the part of the work here that's registered in India. We're involved in education. Mm. involved in health care, we're in, involved in economic development, mm. as well as relief. Mm. And uh, these are areas that we're, our main focus is on. Mm. Um, Education-wise, of mm. course, here in town, in, in this area, we have Silmat Christian Higher Secondary School, which now uh, has grown uh, mm. to over 3,200 students. Mm. We also have another six high schools, mm. Uh, located in Manipur, in Mizoram, in Assam, and in Tripura. Mm. We have another higher secondary or junior college in Assam, and another one in process, the registration work is going on right now, Mm. um, in Assam. And so God has blessed our education work in this way. We also have other schools, we call them grant and aid schools, where we give some assistance to the local people to run their own school, and we provide for uh, two or three teachers' salaries, and then they try to manage the rest. And we have schools like that, uh, again, also in Manipur, Mizoram, Assam, Tripura, Meghalaya. We also have a school all the way out in uh, Uttar Pradesh, in a Dalit village. Mm-hmm. And so these are some of our projects under the education side. Mm-hmm. We also run the Trinity College and Seminary here, mm-hmm. which is... Uh, um, accredited by Asian Theological Association, Mm. and uh, it's now giving degrees up to the Master of Divinity level, MDiv level. And in fact, uh, we now have one of the largest schools, uh, seminaries in not only Northeast India, but all of India. We have 160 students here, Mm. and uh, we will be graduating um, actually the last three years 2020, 2021, and 2022. We couldn't hold graduation ceremonies those two years. So three batches together. Mm. Uh, Next week we'll be having a graduation with 156 graduates. Mm. So God has really been blessing uh, the work there. We have a wonderful trained, Mm. uh, solid faculty. Mm. And uh, God continues to bless that work. So that's on the education side. Uh, here in the healthcare side, we have Silmet Christian Hospital. Mm. And our motto there is to provide affordable healthcare mm. 
-hmm. in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we try to keep our general ward and basic fees very mm -hmm. low mm -hmm. and, uh, and still provide ever increasing, uh, developing higher level of medical services, healthcare services to the people of this area. We also love to go out on medical teams, mobile medical clinics all over the region. Mm. So God has blessed us with a new ambulance to do that. Mm. And so even just now, they were, the team had gone into uh, Kachar area of, of uh, mm. Assam mm. Uh, for about one week and providing free medical assistance to the people mm. there. And so we use this in a way so that we can especially our heart is to bring it to the people who do not know the Lord, the people who are unreached yet with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And this can open mm -hmm. the doors for us and for, for follow-up by pastors and missionaries to go there. And so places like mm -hmm. among the Pangals, mm -hmm. like in you know, some of the villages here, mm -hmm. among the Metes, where um, we find a welcome you know, the, where they welcome our team, mm -hmm. then we'll send our team in there along with pastors and missionaries who work in the nearby area. Mm -hmm. And this gives them mm -hmm. introduction, mm -hmm. and here we are there to serve them in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, people really respond when they know that you really care for them. There's a saying, you know, people don't care what you know mm -hmm. until they know that you care for them. Mm -hmm. Right? So it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how high your theology is, how high your education is, if you don't show the compassion and concern for someone, mm -hmm. they'll never listen to you. Mm -hmm. But if we go showing first God's love to them, mm -hmm. then they'll be more willing to listen to what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we move out, uh, you know, in the healthcare ar arena. I am particularly very curious to know how challenging it is to maintain and sustain particularly mentioning Shilamat Christian uh, hospital. hospital because there are so many notions it's Christian hospital it should be very low expen uh, very it should be almost like free <laughs> but deep down how difficult it is to sustain this hospital well it certainly is uh, mm. a challenge mm. as we see you know mm. we want to provide we do provide a lot of free medical services, mm. and we provide free medical camps at least once or twice a year for the whole community. They can come mm. and get a veil of free services mm. uh, to a certain extent. Mm. There are things that we cannot give totally free, certain mm. surgeries, things like that, that um, there's just a lot of cost to. Mm. But on the whole, we try to keep our rates, especially for general ward, for OPD, for basic testing, mm. as low as we can. Mm. Um, you know, we were comparing mm. rates the other, just yesterday, as we were meeting and uh, seeing that we're still trying to be under the rest of the private hospitals and clinics here. That's our target, mm. always to stay below that. But at the same time, it's a very challenging mm. field because mm. medical equipment costs are so expensive. Supplies, mm. everything involved is expensive. Um, Recruiting and retaining staff is also very challenging mm. because, uh, let's say, whether they're a nurse, a lab technician, a mm. radiologist, a doctor, let's not even mention doctor, we, you know, compared to what they can earn in New Delhi, mm. Calcutta, or even Guwahati, mm. we cannot pay near that much. So we lo lose a lot of our good personnel, they get a job in somewhere in Delhi, mm. and they're paying double what we're paying here. What can we do? You know, so that's always a challenge to recruit good staff, try to keep, you know, paying a little better mm. every year. We try to keep increasing it, but at the mm. same time, that money has to come from somewhere, so we have to increase some fees, you know, mm. to go at least along with the rate of inflation, mm. you know. So these are some of the challenges. I mean, uh, mm. you know, a lot of the equipment, you know, diagnostic equipment, ultrasound, x-ray, um, things like this, a lot of things in the operating room. These are all imported or done, you know, with uh, mm. multinational companies, GE, Philips, Siemens. So 
mm. it all is tied to the exchange rate, dollar to rupees. Mm. And so if the you know, dollar is strong, then our rupee is weak. Mm. These are, this equipment costs more and more for us here. So these are some of the challenges. We have to mm. find a way to you know, recover the cost of that equipment, mm. try to f um, do that without charging too high prices so it still remains affordable for the people. But uh, at the same time, we have to think of the maintenance and repair of that equipment and then replacement eventually. So mm -hmm. these are some of the challenges that we face in running a hospital, especially in a, you know, a, a place like Northeast where things are rapidly developing in this mm -hmm. arena and this, this area and many other areas. That's a very interesting, uh, it's very good that you are clarifying all these things because many people have misconception. It's, uh, the Mission Hospital it has to be as cheap as possible. <laughs> Sometimes they expect it to be cheaper than the civil hospital, which oh. is run by government. Right. So this is a very insightful view, uh, ideas that you are putting across to the people. Mm -hmm. For the last question, uh, I want to ask you, what is your observation when you come down to Chanpur? Is there area that you would like to improve in terms of cleanliness, traffic sense, or uh, our civic amenities. What's your observation? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea which you would like to put across to the viewers mm -hmm. how we can develop in? Well, it's certainly in Churchampur is a rapidly growing area. Mm -hmm. Even not being here for a little over two years and seeing so many new buildings coming up, mm -hmm. multi-story buildings, uh, so many vehicles. It mm -hmm. seems they must be registering mm -hmm. so many new vehicles every day in the transport office here. And, you know, I'm just concerned about this rapid growth mm. and also at the same time we see pollution levels going up. Not just the air pollution from all the vehicles, mm. but along the side of the street, things like this. We really, we really need to clean up our own communities, you know. Mm. Um, we all live here. This mm. is our home. Mm -hmm. And why should we throw things around like this? Even my children in America, they learn from an early age in school, mm -hmm. don't be littering, don't pollute your environment. And this is also something I grew up with, mm -hmm. learning this from an early age. You know, in other countries, there are countries you would not believe how clean they are. In the, they actually sweep the public streets, sidewalks, mm -hmm. in front of their shop, in front of their house. They don't mm. wait for the government, municipal, to come around and clean up. Mm. They do it themselves. Mm. You see this in Japan, you see this in Thailand even, you see it in Netherlands especially. People really take pride in their community, mm. in their environment, and in their area. Mm. Uh, recently I just uh, have a friend who's in Bhutan, mm. and they also have such a high regard for you know, clean, keeping their, their country, their entire country clean. And so there was one area where the gar government had not come and picked up the, the garbage and disposed of it. He personally paid for a pickup truck. Mm. They carted out five loads of the garbage, disposed of it properly in the, mm. you know, dumping ground. Mm. And he said, this is, I love my country, Bhutan, and that's why I'm doing this. Completely on his own, hired the truck, hired the workers himself getting in there and doing it. He said, we do this because we love our country. And he's actually one of the few believers, Christians, mm -hmm. in Bhutan. And I was just seeing his Facebook post and said, it's feeling so wonderful because mm -hmm. not only does he have that sense of community and civic pride, but as a Christian he's doing this. And what a tremendous example he is to the non-believers in his, in his country. Mm. that he's taking on this work because of his love for the country. Mm. So I'm just hoping, praying mm. that through him, many will be reached with the gospel, mm. you know, as he's showing that, acting mm. that out, working that out in a practical way, right mm. in his own corner of his, uh, his village. Thank you so much, Pujon, despite your very tight schedule, people waiting for a meeting. Thank you so much for the conversation that we could have. I think this is gonna help a lot of viewers and try to gain so many insights from what you have been doing, what their views. Mm -hmm. Do you have any last message to tell to the viewers? Um, well, you know, I've been away for some time, 
but you know it is always so wonderful to come back i still feel like this is my home i've spent a lot of time here i've worked a lot here worked with a lot of you here in this area and even in some of the neighboring states and you know i just want to say whatever we do let's continue to do it wholeheartedly we have been blessed with the gospel gospel has come to us now about a little over a hundred years ago you know and if we think back again where would we be without the gospel and where would we be without knowing the message of salvation through jesus christ and this is the way we must continue to live on a daily basis that uh, how we can be a blessing to others just like god has blessed us with eternal life through his son jesus christ none of us deserve it doesn't matter who your father is who your grandfather is not none of us deserve it but yet by his grace he's given us this opportunity to have eternal life and likewise we have to be a blessing to others in small ways in big ways and most of all we have to reach out with that same blessing the blessing of the good news of knowing jesus christ to others so this is what I want to share with my friends out there. Um, let's all do this wholeheartedly. Um, there's, a, there's a world out there that's dying every day without knowing even the name of Jesus. And let's do all we can to reach them with the good news of Jesus Christ. We can own any camp to me. I told him now, but in still dumpy, low pity in Tadama, a Tamzo and Sapa, not take any work. Why ka hi a ngay da along ngay da um kia sa pao thay tin ka a thay lau tin kil son mai diwa tu ne interview apat ba ngay da no bang insa le view na ne wa comment section la mai kia hotel zilega tu ne de weekend on yai tanat sa uta.